The Pride of Navrongo Part 2 From Ghana to America The auditorium of Dyson International School erupted as Wapia walked across the stage, the best student. Sash vivid against her gown. She wasn't just Wapia anymore, she was Wapia, God's gift, a name her father whispered with pride. But amidst the cheers, her phone buzzed in her pocket. It wasn't a congratulatory text. It was a plus one area code. MIT. Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She answered, breathless. A scholarship. Full ride. Computer science and cultural anthropology. The dream was massive, but so was the pressure. As she looked at her parents, her father in his northern fugu and her mother in radiant kenti, she realized she wasn't just carrying her own ambition, she was carrying the hopes of two very different Ghanaian worlds. Before the cold of America, Wapia needed the heat of the coast. She traveled south to Teshi, her mother's hometown. The air here smelled different, salt, smoked fish, and the fermenting corn of Kenki. Her grandmother, the formidable girl woman, sat her down before a steaming bowl of otoma and spicy pak poshito. You go to the white man's land, she said in Ga, but don't forget the rhythm of the sea. She taught Wapia the intricate hand movements of the Panlogo dance, explaining that life, like the dance, is about balance. This was the comedy, Wapia, the precise mathematician, trying to loosen her hips, tripping over crabs on the beach, while her cousins laughed and cheered. She was learning that her accord needed soul. Boston in January was a physical shock. Wapia stepped out of Logan Airport and immediately regretted her heavy jacket, which was barely a windbreaker by American standards. The wind beat her face, the stark contrast to the Navrongo sun. She dragged her pink suitcases, now battered and covered in travel stickers, into her dorm room. Her roommate, a bubbly girl named Jessica from California, stared at Wapia's stash of shito and dried herring. Is that what? biology homework? What is that? Jessica is that asked, nose wrinkling. No, it's not. No, Wapia grinned, popping a jar. This, this is survival. Is survival. The drama began not with a fight, but with a thermostat war, Wapia cranking the heat to tropical levels, Jessica sweating in tank tops. Classes began, and so did the stereotypes. In a Global Innovation 101, the professor asked for examples of ancient technology. When Wapia raised her hand, a student named Brad sneered. What technology? Like, mud huts. The class giggled. Wapia didn't flinch. She stood up. Actually, she said, her voice steady, fractal geometry in African architecture predates Western computing by centuries. She started sketching the Navrongo compound structures on the whiteboard, Professor, explaining the recursive the algorithms used in their design. The room went silent. Brad looked at his shoes. It was an educational mic drop. But Wapia noticed the professor's eyes narrow, not in admiration, but in challenge. Missing home, Wapia decided to cook banku and okra stew in the communal kitchen. She underestimated the power of the aroma. The fermented corn smell wafted through the vents, reaching the third floor. Someone pulled the fire alarm, thinking the building was melting. Fire trucks arrived. Students evacuated in pajamas. Wapia stood outside, holding her wooden spatula, mortified. But then, a Nigerian student named Obina sniffed the air, pushed through the crowd, and shouted, Who is cooking banku? I haven't eaten in months. Instead of expulsion, Wapia found herself hosting an impromptu African feast in the common room, charging $5 a plate. The comedy turned into her first business venture. The semester's final project was announced. Create a security system using non-traditional encryption. Everyone turned to prime numbers and blockchain. Wapia was stuck. She stared at her screen. The blinking cursor mocking her. She called home. Her dad, Tamke Bachera Wura, spoke of the silent weaving patterns. While her mom Alfretina sang a girl lullaby. That's when it hit her. The Teshi dramas. 
The polyrhythms, two beats against three. It was chaos to the untrained ear, but perfect order to the drama. What if she built an encryption key based on ga polyrhythms and navrongo weaving fractals? It would be uncrackable by standard linear algorithms. Wapia spent nights in the lab, fueled by coffee and gari soakings. Her code, Project Oabakan, was working beautifully. It used sound waves of Teshi drums to generate changing visual fractals. But three days before the showcase, she walked in to find her laptop missing. Panic set in. She tracked her cloud backups, deleted. The drama spiked. She suspected Brad. She confronted him in the quad, a crowd gathering. You stole my heritage, not just my homework, she yelled. Brad denied it, but his guilt was written in his sweat. She had 48 hours to rebuild a semester's work from memory. She couldn't record the fractals perfectly from memory. She was sobbing in her room when she found the old, physical notebook from the Navrongo chest tucked in her luggage. And then, she remembered Grandma Veronica's Panlogo lesson. The rhythm wasn't just on the computer, it was in her body. She didn't just type, she tapped the rhythm on the desk, translating the beats directly into binary. Tam tam ka tam. 1-1-0-1, she walked in a trance, chanting the ga songs to keep the sequence. Her roommate Jessica, watching this, finally understood. You're not coding, Jessica whispered. You're composing. The hall was packed. Tech giants were scouting. Brad presented a generic facial recognition app. Then it was Wapia's turn. She didn't use a PowerPoint. She walked on stage with a dondo, talking drum. The audience looked confused. Security, she began, is about predicting the unpredictable. She played a rhythm. The screen behind her exploded into vibrant, shifting kenti style fractals, locking and unlocking files in real time with a beat. This is the Teshi Navrongo protocol, she announced. It doesn't use passwords. It uses culture. The judges were floored. During the questions and answers, a judge stood up. It was the skeptical professor. This is impressive, he said coolly, but isn't it just noise? Can it withstand a brute force attack? He signaled to a hacker team live on stage to crack her system. The room tensed. The hackers ran their scripts. The screen flashed red, then blue. The code adapted, shifting from an avrongo with pattern to a gar rhythm, dancing away from the hackers. They couldn't catch the beat. Then, the twist, the system counterattacked, displaying a message on the hackers' screens, you can't catch me. The audience erupted. Wapia won. But the victory wasn't the trophy. A woman from a major Silicon Valley farm approached her. We've been looking for encryption that mimics organic, chaotic structures, she said. We never thought to look at African art, Wipia smiled. It's not chaos, she corrected. It's complex order. She signed a contract that would pay for her entire village's education fund. She FaceTimed her parents right there on stage. The duality of her identity was no longer a conflict, it was her superpower.